The A7 Corsair II was a particularly intriguing development during a time when the aviation industry was embracing supersonic speeds and experimenting with unique airframe designs in the 1950s and 1960s. Although the Corsair II may not have possessed the supersonic capabilities of many other aircrafts during its time, its reliability and versatility made it a valuable asset for the U.S. Navy. Its unique design allowed it to remain in service even as other more advanced aircrafts were being proposed, making it an important asset for many years. Designed for use during the Vietnam War, the Corsair II was a reliable and powerful strike aircraft that prioritized features such as a large range, a high payload capacity, and cost effectiveness over more flashy attributes. The American combat aviation industry underwent significant changes and rapid development in the 1940s, resulting in the creation of numerous ambitious warplanes, each one more advanced than the previous. During this time, the field of avionics was still evolving and manufacturers concentrated on including supersonic technology in most of their latest designs. The ambitious designs led to the creation of unique and revolutionary airframes. However, many of these designs had a limited service life. Due to the rapid pace of technological advancements and the bold design choices, the cost of researching, developing, and manufacturing these warplanes was high, which became an issue as they were quickly replaced by newer models. By the time they were ready for deployment, an updated version was already being produced in the aircraft factory. As the United States became fully engaged in the Vietnam War, its primary aircraft used by the Navy was the A-4 Skyhawk, which was known for its maneuverability and reliability, but it was nearing the end of its service life. The VOD Corporation was eager to create a replacement as the Skyhawk's limited range and payload capacity were no longer suitable for modern warfare scenarios. During this period, VOD was driven by the shifting philosophy of the time, which led to the development of ambitious designs such as the TLS F-7U Cutlass and the revolutionary supersonic F-8U Crusader, which was considered a powerful weapons platform. Despite the Crusader's impressive performance, it was a costly aircraft that still relied on guns as its primary weapon, making it inefficient as a strike aircraft in the Vietnam War. The U.S. Navy sought a cost-effective and dependable strike aircraft that prioritized operational range and strike capability over additional features, which lead to increased development expenses. To further lower costs, the aircraft was to be based on an existing airframe, with Vought proposing the use of the Crusader. The Navy recognized that supersonic speed, while advantageous, was not necessary for low-altitude strike aircrafts and only added to development and maintenance expenses. This was confirmed by a study group that evaluated 144 hypothetical aircrafts for the sea-based air strike forces. The outcome was a departure from the usual aircraft development philosophy, where it was found that subsonic light strike aircrafts could outperform supersonic ones. The research determined that this type of airframe could be smaller, less expensive, and simpler to produce without compromising on supersonic capabilities. To some, it may have appeared as an unusual move, but the Navy decided to request a subsonic aircraft. The focus was on increasing range and payload capacity, rather than speed. The specifications were significant. The Navy required a strike plane that had twice the range of the previous Skyhawk, and twice the payload capacity, while still being cost-effective to produce and maintain. The objective of the new initiative was to design a warplane that could perform low-altitude dive attacks and to accomplish this goal as quickly as possible by building upon a proven airframe. Russell Clark, an engineer at Vought Aviation, accepted the challenge and quickly put together a team to modify the reliable F-A-2 Crusader into a low-altitude strike aircraft with extended range. As an aircraft launch plane, the new Corsair had to be compact and durable, capable of landing and taking off in confined spaces. Additionally, it needed to be able to be manufactured on a large scale, unlike many other high-speed supersonic warplanes. From the initial trials, the Corsair II far exceeded expectations, boasting over 8,000 miles of range, four times the operational range of the Skyhawk, a much larger payload capacity of over 20 zero pounds, and an increased maximum altitude. Interestingly, it was also slightly faster than its predecessor, the initial models of the Corsair II were fitted with a Pratt & Whitney's TF-30P6 turbofan engines, which replaced the afterburner-equipped J57P-28 turbojet engine from the F-8. As the new light attack aircraft began to be produced on a large scale, the engine manufacturer faced difficulties in meeting the military and civilian demand for that specific model. 
As a result, later versions were equipped with different engines, including the Pratt & Whitney TEF-8, Allison DF-41A2 engines, and a licensed model of the Rolls-Royce Spey engine. The aircraft's engine was fed by a large nose inlet which gave the Corsair II its distinct appearance. However, this feature also presented a significant risk to flight deck personnel, who had to establish specialized procedures to handle the plane. Additionally, an aerial refueling system was mounted on the right side of the nose, enabling mid-air refueling and further increasing the aircraft's already significant range. For self-defense, two cannons were mounted on the bottom of the nose and the ability to mount AIM-9 Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles on either side of the fuselage. Later models had the two cannons replaced with a single M61A1 Vulcan rotary cannon. To decrease the aircraft's vulnerability to ground fire, the flying control hydraulic systems were duplicated, other systems were improved, and much of the fuselage was reinforced with armor. The Corsair was frequently equipped with the innovative IGM-62 walleye television guided glide bomb, which could be aimed using a video screen in the cockpit. The pilot would aim the bomb by locking onto the target on the screen and then firing, after which the pilot could leave the area as the bomb navigated to the targeted location. The A7 was fitted with an NIPQ-116 radar, later replaced by the NIPQ-126, which was integrated into the ILAAS digital navigation system. The radar also fed an IBM navigation and weapons delivery computer, which allowed for precise bombing from a greater standoff distance. Overall, the Corsair had an exceptional avionics system that exceeded most aircrafts of its time. Additionally, it was the first U.S. aircraft to have a modern head-up display, which displayed vital information such as dive angle, airspeed, altitude, drift, and targeting reticule. The technology quickly became a standard feature in all U.S. combat aircraft. In terms of operational history, the A-7 Corsair II flew its first combat missions over Vietnam in May 1970 and played a significant role in the Navy's offensive power during the Operation Linebacker Strikes and the aerial mining of North Vietnamese ports in 1972. Pilots quickly became fond of the new platform, praising it for its responsiveness, ease of use, and exceptional performance in low-altitude strikes and long-range missions. David Frosty Olson, who amassed over 3,500 hours flying the Corsair A7 ABC and H, as well as completing 750 carrier landings, provided a more detailed assessment of the aircraft's strengths and weaknesses. To quote David as an attack aircraft, it was a very stable platform and it handled nicely, but it bled off energy fairly quickly and without an afterburner. During air combat maneuvers, we would end up dropping from the sky like catered from eight all moose just to keep us at the corner velocity. Despite its limitations, the A-7 could still perform well in the right hands, but it was not designed to be a fighter aircraft. Its large fuel capacity also made it useful as an airborne tanker. In total, 1,500 warplanes were built, and the Corsair II became the backbone of aerial carrier-launched operations during the Vietnam War, with up to 854 models participating in over 97,000 sorties. The majority of the missions carried out by the A-7 were low-altitude dive strikes, known for their reliability and pinpoint accuracy. The Corsair II only lost 54 units throughout its combat service in the Vietnam War and was considered a highly survivable platform for the U.S. Navy, despite concerns that its lack of supersonic speed would make it vulnerable to enemy fighters after a dive attack. The A-7 continued to serve for decades after its initial debut, with several different iterations developed, it has flown over 120,000 combat sorties and performed exceptionally well in conflicts in Vietnam, Libya, Grenada, Panama, and Operation Desert Storm. In an era of ambitious and costly aircraft design, the Corsair II proved that sometimes the best aircraft is not the fastest or the most expensive, but the one that can be produced in large numbers while keeping pilots safe. Thank you for watching our video and hit the bell icon to be notified of our newest content. Stay tuned.